Hello friends, this is a clinical case based question uh, related to the CNS and it could be an MCQ. So, for it will be for PG entrance exam or it could be a first prof uh, level question for 10 marks. So, I am covering both angles. Let us see the question and let us see the explanation. Uh, a 70 year old female was brought to the neurology OPD uh, with recent episodes of fall while walking. So, it seems that she is unable to walk properly and frequently there are falls during walk. Upon examination, now this is important, neurological examination, uh, MSME, oh, it is not MSME, it is MMSE, mini mental status examination, MSME is uh, related to some uh, uh, business structure. Okay, so MMSE, that is mini mental status examination. Uh, within normal limits, WNL within normal limits. So, uh, nothing about the higher functions which can be pointed. Uh, muscle tone, normal. Now, that is something which you should uh, keep it in mind. Romberg's test was performed and a tandem walk test, knee heel test or Romberg's test was performed. Normal when the eyes are open but inability to perform when the eyes are closed. So, she had difficulty in walking and she uh, used to fall during walk and now Romberg's test which is the uh, coordination test in the lower limb again, uh, uh, she is unable to perform when the eyes are closed. Now, mild tremors while picking the objects, this was also observed and therefore the question is which of the following is the most likely site of lesion? Anything without any options, anything coming to your mind, probably cerebellum, cerebellar lesion because just because there are tremors while picking the objects. Let us see. So, the options are cerebellum or is it basal ganglia or is it dorsal aspect of the spinal cord or is it pyramidal tract at the internal capsule. This could be the MCQ uh, and uh, right away I will give you the answer answer is not cerebellum, it is in fact dorsal aspect of the spinal cord and let us figure out why is that the answer. But before that, if it is a first prof question, then uh, they could ask these things related. Uh, explain the Romberg's test and the abnormality detected by the Romberg's test. So, you got to explain that for 3 or 4 marks and describe the connections of cerebellum. Now, since there was some hint of cerebellar involvement, therefore, uh, cerebellar connections will, will be asked and then um, maybe enumerate the functions of cerebellum. This could be a 10 marks question at the first year level. Let us understand what uh, is the question and why the answer is uh, not likely to be cerebellum, but dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. Uh, point to be noted here is that the tone, muscle tone is normal. So, uh, it is likely to rule out three options straight away. If it was a basal ganglia lesion, the extra pyramidal lesion or pyramidal tract lesion, there would be hypertonia. All right. Even if it is a, a pyramidal tract lesion in the internal capsule, it is an upper motor neuron type of lesion and uh, it results in hypertonia. Here, the muscle tone appears to be normal or it's, it is normal in fact. Uh, on the other hand, if it was cerebellar lesion, most often the cerebellar lesion lead to hypotonia. So, uh, uh, therefore, this will rule out the three options straight away. Uh, what about mild tremors during the movement? They could be ignored because of the uh, age of the patient, uh, it is a 70 plus and there are likely to be tremors because of a variety of reasons uh, including the other medical conditions or including the medications that, that, uh, that are being taken uh, or simply the age. So, uh, that brings us to the core of this question, inability to perform movements of the lower limbs, that is the only thing that has been noted. Uh, in this particular case and therefore, there is a loss of coordination 
particularly of the lower limbs and it's called as loss of coordination generally is called as ataxia in this case uh, what was observed was ataxia of the lower limb and therefore uh, the lesion is likely to be in the dorsal spinocerebellar tract which is on the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord uh, and uh, therefore that will be answer let's uh, let's explain it further and let's understand the theory theory behind this okay starting with ataxia what is ataxia loss of coordination uh, during the voluntary movements muscle groups cannot be coordinated properly and that's ataxia it is of three types sensory ataxia vestibular ataxia and cerebellar or motor ataxia uh, for the moment uh, let's keep vestibular ataxia aside because there was there was no mention of any vestibular symptoms uh, like let's say vertigo vomiting or any such so let's keep that aside let's focus on these two so either it is sensory ataxia or it's a cerebellar ataxia due to the lesion of the cerebellum we have said cerebellar uh, cerebellum is less likely therefore it is probably a sensory ataxia now what is this sensory versus cerebellar or uh, motor ataxia let's find out now coordination how do we perform well coordinated movements once once we see that then loss of that coordination that is ataxia can be easily understood look our cortex and basal ganglia they decide upon a movement and then signals are sent down on the spinal cord and then anterior motor neuron will start initiate the movements so you can see your anterior motor neuron going to the muscles the concerned muscles and their contractions start uh, after this the master coordinator comes into action the master coordinator for voluntary movements is the cerebellum so it will come into action how once the movement starts the contracting muscles they will generate signals which are called as proprioceptive signals but these are not going to cortex they are going to cerebellum because now cerebellum is going to coordinate the movement so these are unconscious proprioceptive signals not going to cortex so not conscious but it's unconscious proprioception these unconscious proprioceptive signals they come from the muscle to the spinal cord and via spinal uh, via spino cerebellar tracts uh, they will go to the cerebellum so cerebellum needs the information from the muscles now i have mentioned see, see there are two tracts dorsal spino cerebellar and ventral spino cerebellar i have chosen dorsal spino cerebellar because uh, it carries proprioceptive signals from the lower parts of the body and this uh, particular patient had problem with the loss of coordination in the lower parts of the body lower limbs all right so therefore it's the dorsal spino cerebellar tract that we have chosen uh, i have chosen here and it is uh, going from the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord ventral spino cerebellar would be from the ventral aspect so uh, cerebellum is now going going to coordinate all the voluntary movements but to co to coordinate and perform the movement very well it has to receive the signals from those contracting muscles it has to know where the muscle has reached moment to moment changes in the muscle length cerebellum has to be informed about it and then only cerebellum according to uh, as per those signals it can send the signals down again on the spinal cord again it will send the signals back to those muscles and will coordinate the muscle contractions so cerebellum needs information sensory information uh, from the muscles so that is sensory input sensory input which is the proprioceptive input via dorsal spino cerebellar tracts in this case dorsal spino cerebellar tracts uh, and based on that information then the cerebellum takes the further decisions and sends motor output and uh, uh, the motor output is sent back uh, 
to the spinal cord and to those contracting muscles. So, if there is loss of the sensory information, loss of this sensory input going to the cerebellum, it will result in sensory ataxia. And when is that loss uh, possible, loss of sensory input, uh, when is that likely to happen? Here is a sensory signal, muscle to spinal cord and from spinal cord up as dorsal spinocerebellar tract reaching the cerebellum. As you can see here, reaching the cerebellum. So, if there is a lesion of the spinal cord and particularly the dorsal aspect in this case, then this sensory input will not reach the cerebellum. Then cerebellum cannot take the informed decision and cannot coordinate the muscle groups further and further. There will be the loss of coordination and then it will be called as a sensory ataxia. Why is that? Because there is loss of sensory information, proprioceptive information uh, reaching the cerebellum. So, cerebellum uh, does not receive, is not, uh, has no information as to what muscles are doing. On the other hand, if there is a lesion of cerebellum itself, the master itself, then it cannot send any proper signals to the muscles and muscle coordination will be lost again. It will be called as a motor ataxia because motor output coming from cerebellum and going to the muscles uh, is, uh, uh, is in the geopardy. It's not happening and therefore it will be a motor ataxia. Now, coming to the Romberg's test or uh, any other test for coordination. We ask the patient to perform the movement first with eyes open, then with eyes closed eyes shut and uh, thereby we can differentiate between sensory ataxia and motor ataxia. First thing to be understood is uh, in both types of ataxias there is loss of coordination. Then how do you differentiate? Look, when the eyes are open, patient performing the movement but eyes are shut patient is unable to perform the movement, this is sensory ataxia and I will explain why in a minute. Eyes open or eyes shut, patient is unable to perform the movement, then this is cerebellar lesion, cerebellar ataxia or motor ataxia. Clear? Just repeat it once again. Eyes open, patient performs the movement, eyes shut, patient is unable to perform, that is sensory ataxia. Eyes open or shut, patient is just unable to coordinate, then that is cerebellar lesion. Because cerebellum is the master coordinator, if it itself is lesion, then whether eyes are open or shut, doesn't matter, cerebellum won't be able to perform. Now coming to the key part of this particular uh, uh, defect, what happens in the sensory ataxia? Now this is interesting. Cerebellum has to get the information from the contracting muscles. That's the sensory input, proprioceptive input. But in addition to this, cerebellum gets one more input and that is vision, visual input. Our vision, eyes, can see our joints, isn't it? Uh, where when you are making a movement, we can see our joints. In addition to those proprioceptive, unconscious proprioception reaching cerebellum, we can also see our joints. And as you can see here, the eyes, they can see the joints and then that visual input is sent into the superior colliculus and from there, the signals are sent to uh, the cerebellum, tectocerebellar tract. So, in addition to the unconscious proprioception uh, going to cerebellum, from the spinal cord, spinocerebellar tracts, the tectocerebellar tract is also reaching cerebellum, giving the visual information. Visual information regarding what? Regarding the joints, where the joints have reached, where they have reached. This information is reaching cerebellum via tectocerebellar tract. And therefore, they, on the basis of that, cerebellum can make uh, the further adjustments and coordinate the muscle contractions. So, imagine if it is a sensory ataxia. If it's a sensory ataxia, first of all, when does that happen? 
in the spinal cord lesion if it's a spinal cord lesion they are the spinocerebellar tracts are interrupted so no proprioceptive information will be reaching cerebellum but cerebellum can have this visual information regarding the joints that is reaching the cerebellum via tectocerebellar tract so cerebellum based on that information when the eyes are open tectocerebellar tracts are conveying information about the joints so you can see the joints and correct yourself means cerebellum uh, is getting informed about the joint and then it can make the movement but when the eyes are shut uh, remember it's sensory ataxia uh, spinal cord lesion so no information from the contracting muscles and joints and eyes are shut so no visual input also reaching the cerebellum now the cerebellum is clueless it does not have any information regarding the muscle position during a voluntary movement so it will not be able to take any action it will not be able to coordinate the movements and there will be uh, faltering so eyes open patient performed the movement but eyes shut patient could not perform the movement this is typical of sensory ataxia and i explain to you why it happens in this particular manner eyes open so even if there is spinal cord lesion just because eyes are open uh, visual information via superior colliculus into the cerebellum as tectocerebellar tract so cerebellum knows that uh, yeah, they, where are the joints located and it can coordinate the movement further and further but when the eyes are shut even this information does not reach cerebellum and uh, uh, already lesion of the uh, spinal cord is there so no information regarding muscles and joints cerebellum cannot coordinate the uh, contractions so the patient will falter therefore just repeat once again uh, so that you can repeat it in the exam as well eyes open patient performs the movement eyes shut patient cannot perform the movement this is typical of sensory ataxia loss of proprioceptive sensory information uh, reaching cerebellum via spinal cord in this particular patient uh, it was lower limb uh, uh, which were faltering when the eyes were open the patient could walk but eyes shut the patient could not walk could not see where the uh, feet are located so this was sensory ataxia therefore in this patient uh, the diagnosis is sensory ataxia and uh, 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 particularly of the lower limbs and uh, information from lower limbs is sent to cerebellum via dorsal spinocerebellar tracts so probably in this patient there is a lesion of dorsal spinocerebellar tract or dorsal aspect of the spinal cord so this was little more theoretical i understand but with this explanation uh, you exactly know uh, what types of ataxias and how you can diagnose them